welcome to another episode of Video Game Logic. Today's episode was recorded on June the 11th, 2024. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me, as always, the Chicken Man rides again. Caffeine Rage. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a couple of games that we have played. Call of Duty Black Ops 6 is always online, including the campaign, due to, quote, continuous texture streaming. PlayStation CEO drastically underestimates the Steam crowd's patience. And from the community corner, the New Worlds community re- review bombs the game on Steam, and Starfield's latest update draws player ire by sticking a bounty hunting quest behind the Creation Club paywall. Time paywall? The- paywall? Paywall, that was my fault. It's it's all right. We're 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 just gonna keep going. We're gonna ignore it. Pretend I didn't fuck up. I'm Sims will be in the show notes following their respective topics. Hello, Ridge. Uh, sorry, I'm behind the wow. Wow, 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 Wario. Uh, uh, yeah, it turns out Wario's a, a developer on uh, Starfield. Wow, Luigi. I don't know. I don't know why my brain I, went that direction. I, 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 actually, thinking about it, after playing a few WarioWare games, starting to make a little bit of sense. <laughs> yeah. Um but yeah, we're here this week. We did it. We're back. Woo. You know, it's just work and life getting in the way of of doing a recording and playing video games and stuff. We're old men. We have jobs. Yeah, uh for well, however long mine goes. Although it does feel like sometimes I'm the only one doing shit in the back part of the kitchen. Right. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, uh, I told Joe the uh, big kahuna uh, that, okay, I pulled a case of uh, fillets to a case stall. Yeah. And then I added the snippety comment, yeah, because otherwise it's not going to happen. He, and he just said, yeah, pretty much. There is There is the curse of being the only one or one of the only people who is either competent or responsible at your job, depending on, you know, what it is that you're doing. But, you know, that, that phrase like, yeah, uh, you know, I, I just did it. Cause the ones won't get done. And the boss doesn't even bat an eye. They're like, yeah, you're correct. If you didn't do it, nobody else would. That's, that's, that's a curse. Yeah. Yeah. I really need to get out of the chicken man business. <laughs> well, now that you've been a chicken man, you know, you've got something on your resume mm-hmm. and you're in that position where you can just like put feelers out there until something comes around, comes along. Well, the thing is that if I could get into a more like a sit down restaurant and with, I hate to say a proper kitchen, but you know, where I'm doing more than just deep frying shit. Yeah. My pay goes up dramatically. <laughs> Even uh, uh, the cheaper uh, places, I pay at least slightly better than what uh, I'm getting paid. But mind you, I'm not minimum wage. Right. But I'm also towards the upper end of uh, the pay plateau before hitting uh, you know, shift lead. Right. And honestly, with the responsibilities that the shift leads and the managers have... It's not worth it. It's uh, it's barely worth it being chicken bitch. Yeah. Like, right now, uh, there's a big kerfuffle about some money missing. I, I don't know the details, because that is literally the other end of the kitchen from me. And I rarely even interact with the register to take an order. And usually right. when I do, it's, you know, one order and, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, uh, they're they're trying to figure out, you know, who took it or you know, what happened to it. Somebody's got their hand in the till, though. Or uh, has possi- made a little bit oh, of a fucky-wucky. Uh, yeah. And the thing is, we also just took on a new idol. A new what? Idol? Uh, uh, it's my jokingly term uh, for the uh, the high schoolers. Oh, okay. It, they're, they're idol. I got you. Idol. Although yeah. one of them is no longer ill, uh, she's a biggle now. A because she biggle. Eight, she graduated and turned eighteen. That's cute. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, that's pretty cute. But yeah, uh, and there's some complaints about 
uh, his work uh, demeanor because yeah. they put him, uh, you know, at, you know, high schoolers could only be in certain spots and, you know, all of them are pretty much customer facing. And he's on the drive through a uh, headset in one uh, over one ear, AirPod on the other. And it's just, oh boy, right? That does sound like, yeah, that does sound like every high schooler, though, that I've ever seen working at a fast food place. <laughs> and I mean, you? I I'm have... complaining about that. Like, mm-hmm. fuck, I don't know what I'd do if I worked in fast food. I mean, uh, I, I, I have an earpiece that I wear, that uh, Bluetooth earpiece for, uh, to stream music. But yeah. the thing is, I'm also not customer facing. <laughs> I see people, well, as long as they don't just randomly wander into the restaurant while I'm opening, you know, uh, just a couple of times a day. Yeah. Dude, the the youth are just built different. I mean, I think that's that's the thing. Like, the kids are always, you know. Well, part of, uh, at least with uh, my niece, pretty much as soon as she got on TikTok, her attention span just, you know, was shattered. Right. I know, I know. I'm sounding like old man yells at cloud. However, I did see it with my own niece, you know. <laughs> yeah, she... Uh, she used to have a lot more uh, more patience with things. Now it's not, you know, if it's not 30 seconds, she's done. Yeah. Like, tried to, last time she was over, tried to watch a movie. Didn't even get through the opening credits. And she was on her phone, uh, completely tuned out. Uh, ear, uh, earbuds in. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm thankful that my kid doesn't have access to TikTok or... YouTube shorts or, you know, any of the other copies of TikTok that are out there. I'm not looking forward to the day when we we pull back on some of his restrictions for things like that and he discovers it. My kid already sometimes struggles with his attention. He has ADHD and we try to work with the flow of ADHD as opposed to just fighting against it all the time. Well, she but... also has that and TikTok has made it worse. Yeah. Thankfully, I've 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 been of two minds about the idea of like parental controls on devices and things, but I will say I'm thankful that like we just started out that way with my kid, because I think you can take parental controls and like you know lockdowns and things too far, but mm-hmm. there are uses to being able to like limit your kid's access to certain things, and so whenever he does get those apps on his phone. You know, it, it, so begins the struggle of of parent versus youth to create boundaries and rules and enforce them and the child's attempt to break them. You know, it was, I guess it's been a few months ago now when, you know, I was like, oh, hang on. My kid just lo- is supposed to be in bed, but he just yeah. opened up a game <laughs> on Steam. And we've yeah, had some. Yeah, you saw the pop up. <laughs> yeah. We've had some other issues with, with things like that where that he's tried to hide stuff and of course it's like you walk in and like kids are so they're so good at telling on themselves before they figure out how to like play it cool because like i walk into his room for something and he's like sitting up in bed like staring at me and i'm like something's up what are you doing what were you doing before i came in here whereas if he had just like been laying in bed with like a book or something, I wouldn't have thought twice about it. But, like, he's sitting in bed, I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, I walk over, and he's got, like, his 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 DS or his Switch, like, hit under the covers or under the pillow. And I'm like, come on, bud. I was a kid once, too. I know what you're doing. So, I, you know, parental controls, I think, have got a place, as long as you don't go, like, to nanny state with them. But, anyways, how do we get off on this tangent? <laughs> I don't know, uh, vid- uh, video- teenagers. Yeah, teenagers. Video games. We played some games. Let's talk about the games that we played, Rage. Woo! We did it. Back on track for whatever that's worth. Um, do you want to go first, or do you want me to go first? Yeah, I think, I my- think mine will be a bit shorter because it's more first impressions. Because this is not a game that I could talk about in depth for a, probably a couple months. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, means, so I upheld my promise, and once they announced, well, uh, it wasn't the announcement. It was once the uh, complete pack goes on deep discount, I'll get Civ Six. And hey, they announced Civ Seven, and the complete pack went on deep discount. So, 
I'm now the proud owner of Civ Six and probably about what like thirty DLCs for it. Yeah, huzzah! Woo! So it, it takes some getting used to. Uh, Civ Five was a big jump on some aspects, uh, but it was more. It, it was a safer evolution, in my opinion. Right. Making it so uh, changing the squares to hexes, a little controversial, but eh. uh, but uh, the big thing was essentially unstacking the armies. Yeah, that that was the major design change in Civ Five. Civ Six it has a lot more nuance to its uh, changes that I've encountered so far because, m- mind you, I'm pl- I never really played the base game of Civ Six. I'm uh, going into it with both DLCs or both expansions already enabled, all the DLCs enabled. So yeah, just going for the full experience, you know. Yeah. Uh, but the big change for Civ Six is unstacking the ar- the uh, cities, like they did the armies, so that the districts are separated from the city center. And I- I'm still up in the air on how I feel about this change. Mind you, I am I'm pretty much, before I even finished downloading the game, I installed a mod so I could uh, remove districts and swap them around. Because having that as a permanent decision just feels idiotic to me. Because it kind of ignores the idea that not just civilizations evolve, but your playstyle evolves. Uh, your opportunities will change throughout the course of the game to the point that the decisions you made at turn 100 being a unmeetable decision that you cannot go back on at turn 400, right? Yeah. Just never really gelled with me. So, yeah. Uh, that's one thing I installed pretty much right away. Uh, the expansions, the Big like ma- uh, the major change I've encountered so far uh, is the natural disasters. So I'm playing as Rough Rider Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> uh, because America is typically a safer like middle ground uh, uh, civilization to start off with. You know, it's usually it was more strength in military, but you typically have options elsewhere uh, to go for different victories or uh, different aspects of the game. Right. So it's not, you know, a whole America fuck yeah, it's more uh, it's the safe bet for a first game, you know? Yeah. Well, the river uh, 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 settled on, which one little aspect, I don't know if it's in the DLC, I don't know if it's space game, if it was a patch. But they'll actually name landmarks and name the continents as you play. So I'm on the Columbia River uh, with Washington, D.C. And the Columbia River likes to flood. (laughs) Uh, So every so often, the river will flood. And it'll add fertility to to uh, to the tiles that it floods on. It's still the hex grid. But... Uh, any improvements that happen to be on those tiles that flood, and it will mark off, you know, which tiles are in danger of flooding, uh, can be damaged. It has to be uh, rebuilt by the builders. So there is that, but uh, you know, it's a, a, a dual purpose. You know, it, you have to repair every so often, but you're getting extra fertility, so extra food and. Uh, uh, which uh, leads to faster civilization growth. So, right, right. Uh, volcanoes will uh, occasionally increase the fertility of uh, tiles around them. Uh, on the other end of the continent, there's been a major droughts m- multiple times in the first, you know, like hundred some turns I played. Uh, that's uh, impacted a city state, which uh, city states seem to be more proactive in this version. Uh, I, the I can't remember what one's north of me, but the one north of me is like in this embattled uh, conflict with uh, a group of barbarians uh, to this uh, to the west of me. So yeah, you know, they're sending uh, you know several naval units uh, 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 with uh, uh, ground soldiers as well. 
uh, to try to eradicate the barbarians. So seeing you know, more activity on the map is uh, honestly really interesting to me. And it also makes me wonder what happens if I start picking on city-states. Because that was kind of a tactic in Civ Five was just, you know, uh, especially for certain civilizations, was you know, pick on the city-states and basically you know, get them under control through diplomatic or warlike means. Well, the city states are have a little bit more teeth this time, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think it was like uh, Venice in Civ Five that their whole playstyle was around getting all the city states on your side. Mm-hmm. But anyway, sorry, carry on. Yeah, and it's just uh, it's fascinating, and also there's another like loyalty program or uh, thing going on that's in one of the expansions where. If your city is kind of shit, it could actually leave your civilization and become an independent city. And if there's another civilization nearby that's ext- that's putting out, uh, pr- uh, well, they, uh, the term is pressure. I'm not sure if it's civic pressure, if it's tourism, or or what actual mechanic is uh, behind it. It could actually join. So. To the northeast of me is Russia. Okay? Uh, just by pure chance, you know? Right. So, Pierre the Great. Pierre the Great, uh, uh, one of his cities wasn't too happy with him. Don't know why, but it eventually uh, became an independent city. So, I took the opportunity, to, uh, took some units over there, and started battering it, and it suddenly decided, you know what, America, fuck yeah. (laughs) So it actually swapped sides to me, which later on might come to bite me in the ass because one of the versions of declaring war is reclaiming uh, cities like that. Yeah, cities that had uh, swapped sides. Yeah. So they have uh, kind of well, in Crusader Kings, it's the, and I'm blanking on the proper term of it, but the the reason for war. Oh, the Casus Belli? C- Casus Belli. So it's essentially like a Casus Belli, you know? Yeah. Uh, with an objective uh, to recapture the city. So they could actually do that uh, if, you know, Peter the Great can get his shit together. I'm I'm still in my first game, though, so... Uh, you know, there's still a lot for me to d- kind of discover. They ha- ha- they have split uh, civics into its own tech tree, uh, which is also how government is run. So uh, for every civic you get, you uh, get essentially playing cards mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, that you can build your government around uh, and pick and choose kind of how your government runs. And every age, you could uh, unlock forms of government that have different positives and drawbacks and also have different, like, slots that you can slot these cards into with more complex uh, forms of government having more slots to do so. So there's, like, uh, uh, a government that's more focused on military might will have more red slots to be able to run more military ca- uh, policy cards. Ones that's uh, more based on uh, uh, Art and uh, uh, tourism will be have more purple slots to slot those, while science-based uh, governments will have more blue slots. And it's an interesting way to kind of swap up and sure up uh, different aspects of your civilization that may be uh, lacking, or to really exploit what you are good at. So uh, I've been cranking out great scientists. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, my uh, government, which allows me to get a tech advantage. Yeah. Uh, and the great scientist in this game, instead of just give you know, essentially giving you a complete uh, technology, instead it uh, gives you essentially a head start on the te- on two or three technologies, or, or sorry, two technologies and one civic. Don't ask me why the great scientist is giving civics. I don't question it, right? Uh, but that's kind of uh, been kind of like my play style right now. I am playing mostly on the Steam Deck 
and it's actually run pretty well. Yeah. Although, you know, early game on a map with, I think, eight uh, players total, but turn times have been pretty good. I'm running a bit lower graphics settings just to get some more battery life. I'm getting mm-hmm. three and a half, four hours of battery. So, hey, there's your limiter, right? <laughs> yeah. One more turn. One more turn. Mm. No, your battery's empty. Yeah, it's been since the last time I played Civ Six was in 2018. Um, so there there are bits and pieces that I can remember, but all, a lot of the specifics are just you know completely mushy in my brain, you know. So, but I'm gonna get the uh, whatever it's called the the pack that you got. Um, yeah, to there's have all the, the DLC. there's the there's the platinum edition. And then there's the anthology. Platinum is a few of the le- uh, leader packs and the expansions, and the anthology is everything, which has a few, uh, uh, a lot more leader packs, uh, different scenarios, and uh, it was like a t- what a ten dollar difference. Yeah, which is which is not too shabby. Not too yeah, there's shabby. ten Even different the t- items uh, in uh, the anthology versus the platinum edition. Yeah. So, we'll see. I'll probably wind up just getting the anthology. Like, it's only an extra 10 bucks, but um, I'm not as interested in those leader packs and things. But Yeah, well, for me, it's adding more spice, you know? Yeah. Because whenever I start up a game, I'll hit just random leaders. And some are kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, looking back at the uh, historical reviews, they're... Uh, you know, they're very negative because I don't think they're each worth, you know, like at nine bucks a pop. But once you factor in the, you know, the bundle and bringing it, the price of everything down, it's not too bad. Yeah. You know, like the Ethiopia pack, five bucks, which with the bundle, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. All right. Is that is that it for your? I, I think so. I, like I said, I'm still essentially early game. Um, there is a uh, change to like the golden age as well, where as you progress through the game, you're getting an era score, and I don't know what actually triggers it, but I'm not sure if it's just based off turn time because I, whenever I set up my first game, I set up a set number of turns, or if there's certain, like, milestones, uh, the end of an era starts, and if you have uh, more, or less than a certain amount of era score, you go into a dark age. If you have uh, more than that, you go, you know, go into, you, know, you just transition, but if you have enough era score, you go into a golden age. I think that was part of the Rise and Fall DLC. I don't, I don't remember that being a thing from when I had played. I think it is from our one of the expansions. Uh, But playing with how they do the Golden Ages is interesting. Because before, you know, uh, Civ 5, if you set it up right, you could just go from Golden Age to Golden Age and just crank out the uh, the tech, right? Yeah. But you're also given the option of what actually contributes to your error score. So if you set it up right, you can really get rolling on it. I did not set it up right because I don't know the game that well. <laughs> right. Oh, and also the other big change is uh, builders. Uh, builders are a consumable unit. They just don't, you know, you know, wander around the map after a while. Uh, I think you get three uses at base. And then there's policies and tech that you could get that it slowly increases that more and more. Which I'm torn on at one point uh, you know it, it's frustrating to have to constantly rebuild them at the same point and Civ 5 after you know, like mid game they just kind of hung out in the corner of the map until I needed them yeah especially since they removed the need to build roads instead roads are uh, built through trade or trade routes so you're more emphasized to uh, do different trade routes to get a road network going. Which I believe that is from an, one of the older Civ games because there was there was the Civ game that came out on console, and I think that's how they did it. 
Hang on. I think it was called Civilization Revolution. Through the Google. Yeah, Civilization Revolution. And it was on console and mobile. And that's how it handled building roads. Was trade networks between your your towns or between cities. Which I actually kinda like. Mm-hmm. You know, not have to worry so much about it. So that kinda naturally happen. Yeah. Uh it's uh makes it so that you know you're not micromanaging builders to try to build a road network, you know? Right. And also uh trade depots are, are uh built automatically in the background and yeah, you know, it's more streamlined. And it feels weird it's more streamlined whenever they added a lot more complexity to the city building, you know? Yeah. But I like I Civ think, 6. I, I, I'm still on the fence. I think I still like Civ 5 more, but it's, uh, Civ 5 is you know, like a well-worn uh, pair of pants, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I know what I'm getting into when I fire up Civ 5. Uh, Civ 6 has a lot m- more features that I just don't know what's going on with yet. And it's also one of those that uh, it requires a lot more overall planning, especially for building cities. Although, you know, I, since I can tear down districts with a mod, you know, that does remove a little bit of it, but uh, you know, you can still settle on a place with the city that you're planning to do one thing. And oh, uh, the city is not going to be uh, usable for that. Whoops. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, my game, at least the one I'm going to talk about this week, because I've had actually a couple that I've played, but this one is uh, the and, and slightly older one now. It's been a few weeks since I played it. Uh, Class of 09. So Class of 09 was shown to me by one of my therapy clients, actually. Um, he's a teenager. And um, it's interesting it is a visual novel somewhat choose your own adventure style game um there are 13 15 13 or 15 different endings that you can get by the different choices that you make throughout the game and these choices are speed running a whole bunch of traumatic Mm -hmm. issues that faced you know high schoolers and to a certain extent still face high schoolers but faced high schoolers in the mid to late 2000s um there's some very some things very specific to that era to where that if you were in school then or had been in school around that time period i think you would recognize specific cultural references as well as um specific sort of ideas and concepts that historically were starting to squeak their way out into the limelight things like the beginnings of um or, or i wouldn't say the sit wouldn't say the beginnings of but sort of in a in an immediate post obama world right after president obama was elected was elected when the white supremacists started to come out of the woodwork a little bit um started to flaunt that since now there was a black president um so one of the teachers is named you know, kind of on the nose, like Mr. White, and he's uh, a white nationalist. And so, like, for example, a couple of the choices you can make revolving around him, because, you know, he's one of your teachers, so there's some scenes with him. But one of the choices you can make with him is, like, for extra credit, you know, you can do this photo shoot with him, and then it puts you in a position where you can choose to sort of lean into that, like, yeah, why can't white people be pr- proud, too? Why can't white people have pride and get you know, a, a couple of different endings as a result of that, um, going down that, that thread. Um, you play a very troubled teenager. Um, she has been, uh, abused, um, physically and is traumatized by the death of her father. Like this, this very clearly is someone or a group of people's like explicit trauma, like for sure. You know, the people who have made this game have lived this experience or are very close to people who have lived these experiences. Um, oh, shit, it started playing. Stop. The, the trailer started playing, and I'm like, Where's the, where's that sound coming from? But anyways, um, so it's, it's very specific. And the game, like, pulls no 
punches like at first like so there's at one point there's a choice that you get on on your like weird handheld phone thingy before smartphones were like commonplace um so you're like weird pda thing like it, it displays the choices that you can make in situations and one of them and like it even it like this is on the the steam store page like you can choose to go to a concert or stay home and kill yourself and when you get to that the first time you're like stay home and kill myself fucking what and then you you, you click on it to see what happens and you get one of the endings because your character kills herself um so it's it's wild. It is buck wild. And as someone who was in high school in the mid to late 2000s, like I recognize all of these spe- spe- specific cultural touch points, these, um, you know, the forming of the identities of like neckbeards and incels and white supremacists and the way that they started to squeak out into culture at the time and um, the different ways that like sexual abuse was, was, not being handled and like we as a society don't do a lot better these days but there are differences and there are improvements that have been made and so it's it's a very interesting take on being a teenager in the 2000s um there's this one like creepy kid uh who i think the kids today would refer to as as a simp for your character but like he's just like sort of like a creepy like stalker guy who follows you around and every time you complete um w- or every time you get one of the endings rather you get some kind of text in the main menu that you can look at and they slowly sort of weave a story together and a few of the texts are from other characters but most of the texts are from this creepy stalker guy and you don't know like i mean you you don't know who it is at first but after a few endings, especially once where you interact with this kid, it's like, oh, okay. And, like, he's, he's like, the fucking, like, school shooter. Like, there's not a scene, at least not one that I've found, that explicitly is, like, somebody shooting up the school. But, like, this kid is, like, he's the school shooter. If that, if that scene happens, like, he's the school shooter. And that's, like, the archetype he plays. Who does he wear a trench coat? He does! There's a scene where he wears a trench coat. So... It's it's interesting and it's not for everybody. Um you have to be the right kind of person to to like this game, I think. But if your tastes and your interests tend to line up with mine, I think there's something here for you. Um I bought the bundle. It was on sale. So I bought the bundle that had Class of 09 and then Class of 09 re up which plays or which shows another character that like you, you run into in the main game, but it's like some stories through her, um, through her eyes and some different things, you know, that are her experiences. But I, you know, there's a lot of, of air quotes, content and context to be mined out here. So I would imagine it's, it's more of the, the same, just with some different subjects, but yeah. Bunch of different endings, really interesting, in my opinion, thought-provoking game, but you have to be able to deal with how sort of crass and doesn't give a fuck that it, it exudes, because there are many more decisions to make that are just as edgy and on the nose as go to the concert or stay home and kill yourself. So you I mean, have to damn, be prepared right? for that. Yeah. I mean, well... Saturday. Got nothing else going on. Better than going to church tomorrow. Yeah, let's see. Let me, let me. I took a few screenshots to share with a couple folks. Uh, okay. One, another one of the choices, date your gym teacher or get sexually harassed by someone your own age. That was, that was another one. Um, and then I've also screenshotted to go to the concert. Do I at least get an A if I date the gym teacher? No. But he fucking kills you. Like, literally, he kills you if you date the gym teacher. And you continue to follow through with the decision to like go back to his house. He murders you. Well, it's still better than going to church. Yeah, at, at, at no point do you go to church. I don't even think that there's like a religious person. You're you're in like some school in California, I believe. I see they um, outlawed uh, a religion in California. So That's why made, it's a godless land. So they made the smart decision, right? Got <laughs> it. Gotcha. But class of '09. 
I do fully recommend it, but only to the right kind of person. This isn't like an everybody should go buy this recommendation. But it's interesting, and it's thought-provoking, and it's... You know, I kind of like that edgy shock value style of like humor and presentation. So, class of 09. give it a give it a give it a look see. So yeah, that's that's the games that we played this week. Now we've got a few news topics. Woo. Um, this one, our first one, Call of Duty Black Ops Six, always online, including campaign due to continuous texture streaming. <laughs> Oh. This is so fucking stupid. Mind you, uh, the install size for the entire game with all modules, all right? Uh, now, they have come out and said that, uh, no, the actual install size isn't that, because it's including, you know, like, uh, you know, the zombies mode, the online, the single player, blah, blah, blah. It's just shot 310 gigabytes, all right? Mm-hmm. And now they're saying, yeah, that's low because uh, we're doing online texture streaming. First of all, bullshit. Yeah. There is absolutely no way. I'm willing to bet this is all bullshit. Because there is just no way that they're going to be able to stream textures fast enough in order to not make it an absolute shit show. Because I remember a game called Rage. Uh, not not just because, yeah, Rage, but uh, that had a horrendous time with its texture streaming. And it was all local. It was doing texture or streaming through the Unreal Engine, and it did it poorly. So every time you turned too fast, the world got, like, muddy for, like, half a second. Because it was trying to stream the textures from the hard drive, you know? Yeah. And now they're saying that they're wanting to stream the textures from some server farm and twiddle your ball sack, New Mexico? No. No. Hey, that New Uh, Mexican server farm can twiddle my ball sack. I don't discriminate. I mean, it's just mom ball calling that this is uh, what they're trying to say is the reason. Mind you, Call of Duty has had a major problem with their install size for a long time. (laughs) Mostly because they pander to the consoles and to get every ounce of processing power out of those damn things. Uh, They just do uncompressed audio. I mean, Titanfall did this as well. So that's probably the main reason why this game is so fucking big. But I remember a game that claimed to do uh, computing through the cloud and your computer wasn't strong enough to be able to run it. And that turned out to be bullshit too. A Sim City, <laughs> uh, Sim City 2013. Remember they were talking about how it was going to be using cloud computing to be able to run in the back to uh, do the hard number crunching in the background. Yeah, I do remember that. That was bullshit too. Yep. I'm, uh, you know, this this reeks of like attempted DRM bullshit in order to to get more money out of people. Yeah, and, yeah, I'm just trying to come up with any justification that sounds believable to the layman. Because yeah. uh, you and me, we're the extreme edge, you know? We we are the edge lords. We understand this is absolute bullshit. And that it's been tried before and with different variations and there's no way that they're going to be able to stream textures. We know that this isn't going to work. How they can't make it uh, work when it's just the video f- uh, uh, feed and, uh, yeah, the controls going back and forth, right? <laughs> Trying yeah. to do uh, co- uh, Call of Duty uh, as a cloud game if you're not, you know, in the same city as the server farm. I, I just imagine that as unplayable. I tried to do Forza Horizon 5 on Xbox uh, uh, Ultimate Game Streaming. And that just turned into just an absolute shit show after, like, just moderate speeds. And Call of Duty has a lot of, you know, flicking back and forth. And there's just no way it's going to work. So, yeah. It's more just point and laugh at this one, to be honest. I will say, 
I don't know what the point of this is. Like, I don't, I don't know what they hope to achieve. Because a lot of a lot of decisions that are made from AAA companies, I can look at them and say that's a bad bad idea, a bad choice. But I can see what you're pursuing here. I mean, it's obviously it's money. It's always money. But I don't, <coughs> I don't know what purpose this serves. Because I feel like this is only a net loss. The people who were going to buy Call of Duty anyways are going to buy it, or we're going to buy it. There's going to be some loss of revenue because people like you and me are going to look at this point and laugh and then fuck off somewhere else. And I get that that's not like a huge drop in revenue. But then also you cut off a portion of your population for, for places in the world that don't have stable internet. Or good internet, even if it is stable. Well, like, see, they know, high speed. See, my theory is that they crunch the numbers, and the losses outweigh the benefits. That uh, they won't see the game pirated as quickly. Assuming that it can be pirated, or does it have you know some sort of actual files going back and forth? Yeah. Which, oh boy, if you're on a metered uh, internet, oh boy, right. Yeah. Because texture files can quickly eat that up. Uh but they're it's all about control really. I mean, Call of Duty never really goes down in price. Even uh you know, games that are a decade old at this point uh are still being sold for full price, aren't they? Yeah. They've got sales occasionally, but usually they're sold for full price. Are only at a very slight discount over original pl- original price. Yeah, so they just don't want that loss of sale whenever it eventually, you know, does get cracked, right? Yeah, they, they want to hold it out as long as they can. Oh, I'm trying to search Call of Duty is a pain in the ass because you know, it's like uh, since I have really z- zero interest in the game. I have no idea what ones are the older ones. <laughs> but let's just put it this way. Uh, uh, here's one, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2011. It's still 40 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you can get Call of Duty 2 for 20 Like the OG Call of Duty 2 from yeah, like the 2000, mid-2000s? Yeah, 2005. It's still 20 bucks. What a steal. I think steal is uh, all the damn DLCs and... Uh, uh, skins for it. I mean, just I'm looking at Call of Duty Ghosts and holy shit, <laughs> the long play. That's what this is. Because well, uh, okay, oh. so Call of Duty Ghosts. This is just one that kept popping up over and over again on DLC. Uh, 2014. All right. Uh huh. The complete bundle for Call, uh, Call of Duty Ghosts is 180 dollars. I'm not surprised. It has 50 DLCs with, looks like about half of them are just uh, gun skins. Gotcha. But no, this this is a long play. Now that Mm -hmm. I think about it for a few extra minutes, like, how do you keep people buying the newest Call of Duty? You tie it to a server, you know, even the single player. And then sunset it after a couple of years. And then you sunset it after a couple of years and you force people to buy the next one. Yeah, they... uh, Actually, uh, let's see. Uh, what? Let's see, uh, Steam Char. I just got a list of all the Call of Duty games. I mean, here's uh, Call of Duty from. Which one is this one? Uh, okay, okay. So, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Uh, doesn't really list players here. I'm just trying to find, like, yo. Yeah, uh, how active are some of the older ones? But I know that there's definite popular Call of Duties that people stick on. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't surprise me that this is uh, just a long play to get people off of uh, older ones to get them onto a newer one. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. I wouldn't argue that Call of Duty is art, but there's a idea that, yeah. It should be still preserved, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for somebody that wants to go back and play it. Like uh, uh, Call of Duty Black Ops, the original one, uh, is still seeing uh, 
eight hundred some people uh, at peak uh, every t- every day. Which the original Black Ops is twelve, thirteen years old now. I think mm-hmm. late two thousands, early twenty tens. Uh, twenty ten ex- exactly. Actually, okay. Um, Call of Duty World War Two, uh, from two thousand. Uh, 17 uh, still gets, you know, 500 some players at peak. Yeah. With uh, weekend peaks uh, going up to the 7 800 range. I'd imagine they're all playing zombies. Um, I found the button to actually uh, sort by date, but. Yeah. Some of these actually still have a fairly decent little player base on them. We uh, covered Black Ops 2. I got the previous one after scrolling through all the goddamn DLC for it. <laughs> Miss it because, right? Mm-hmm. Call of Duty Go. Oh my god. It actually has a Snoop Dogg voice actor pack. Or voiceover pack. Damn, right? That doesn't surprise me. Okay, that's a bad example. It has uh, a 24-hour peak of 124 people. <laughs> I was thinking that it might have a little bit more because you have so much DLC, so you have the sunk cost. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm someone who one day will go back and play most, <laughs> many of the Call of Duty campaigns because I like the campaigns. But, you know, if this is a thing, I'll just I'll just stop playing the new ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the thing, is that, uh, well, if they all go on uh, line only and they just sunset the authentication servers you know, go, and go full Ubisoft, you won't be able to go back and play the old ones, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, all right. Well, ready to do the next one? I think so. Okay, our next news story PlayStation CEO drastically underestimates the Steam crowd's patience. So this new story is talking about how PlayStation CEO in an interview was saying, in a nutshell, well, okay, we're going to put the first title of a game on on PC, like on multi-platform. And then we're going to put sequel titles exclusively on PlayStation so that people who play on PC will buy PlayStations to play the sequels. Yeah, I, I think I'm of two minds on this one because, yes, I do ag- uh, agree that, yeah, I think the PlayStation CEO is underestimating not so much patience as not wanting to deal with consoles for at least the hardcore crowd. Yeah. Because if the, he's talking about just exclusivity in general, then you know, no amount of patience is really going to fix that, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, wanting to just stick with an old title, yeah, you know, that's, you know, there's entire communities built around just going back and playing games from, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. So the patient gamer is, you know, a thing that I think that they're not really counting on just in general because... Consoles are all about you know chasing that bleeding edge, but at the same time, I've seen people talk about buying you know the same game multiple times as it comes out on different devices. Uh, Grand Theft Auto being a really good example of this, uh, buying it on last gen hardware, then it released on next gen hardware, then it released on PC, and they bought on all three. Yeah. I mean, I do think that the examples of that are Grand Theft Auto, Skyrim, um, has Red Dead 2 been released on multiple hardware? Multiple types of hardware? I think so. Red Dead 2, but not the first one. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, I think they're... But we're also looking at people that already have those consoles, generally. Yeah. And... Trying oh, to, uh, I think trying to make the argument that they're going to be so over the uh, head over heels for a particular series to want to dump, you know, five hundred, six hundred dollars on new hardware, and you know, assuming that they even have the setup to be able to, yeah, you know, just plug a console in, right? Yeah, I think is a little bit mistaken. 
I think, you know, obviously there are people that kind of exist and or people exist on a spectrum. So I can't be like, nobody is going to do this. That's, you know, it's hyperbole. But I think that they underestimate the willingness of the PC crowd to do this. And like you said, it has nothing to do specifically with their, with their patients or, but more just like people, people are creatures of habit. And so lots of times people will get dug in or reinforced into whatever their current position is, even if it's not like a malicious thing, but you know, it, it, it can be, but um, you know, people who play games mostly on PC are over time going to build environments to where that their PCs are better, their PC setup is nicer, their PC environment is more welcoming, and that can be the physical aspects of, of their desk versus, like, other things that they do with, on, or around their PC. And then looking at the economic situation of, of the generation that they are, I think, hoping will buy into this, they just don't have that that disposable income. Like... I mean, I how, don't... Uh, you're still looking at, yeah, you know, 450 bucks, assuming, you know, buying a PlayStation and a game. 450, 500? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it would be more than that. Let's, let's, let's go to... Well, let's do... well I'm, I'm looking at Walmart, looking at play, uh, a PlayStation. So that's 400 right there. Okay. And I'm assuming buying no other accessories, literally just, you know, they have to pl- uh, play the next Spider Man, so they're buying that and Spider Man. You know, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you're looking at dropping, you know, five hundred ish dollars, and that's of course assuming uh, uh, they're doing the digital console slim that doesn't even have a disc drive. If you're getting the disc drive version, you're looking at four hundred fifty right off the bat before you even uh, deal with uh, getting a disc. Yeah, so you're looking at five hundred to five hundred and fifty dollars to mm-hmm. get set up, and of course, once you've got the hardware, you don't need to buy that again. But you know, so that's a one time purchase. But it's like I don't know. People reinforce their own habits, their own existing habits. People, you know, again, there are exceptions across every category, but people generally won't spend money on something like that if they're not interested or willing to invest in it further because it's such a big commitment like this all this again seems like a boneheaded business move that i'm sure they will get some sales and who knows maybe it's gonna be it would be more successful than i think it would but i just feel like they are 10 years behind the curve on this if if playstation had 10 years ago started bringing exclusives to pc like maybe they'd have something and maybe in 10 years they will I'm not sure once they've had time to build that audience, you know, but this just seems like a dumbass, not well thought out move. Of like, oh, how can we, you know, get more money out of people? I mean, how if they even talked about uh, doing a delayed release, yeah, make it console first, but they're trying to do console exclusivity, which uh, I think it's just going to turn people off. It, once the, uh, once uh, the first uh, series it gets, you know, get hit with that, I think it's going to hurt their sales on the next one that they put on PC because, well, me personally, I, I see the first uh, series get uh, console exclusivity on the sequel. I'm less likely to buy you know your next game just in general on PC. Yeah, I, and I know I'm, I know I'm an extreme, but yo, know, there's others out there. Yeah, I mean I'm the same way though. Like I'm in the same camp as you on this one, and. I don't know. Maybe I'll bring I'm out ex- the marshmallows. Maybe I'm, thank you. Maybe I'm expecting too much, quote unquote, out of the the PC crowd. But like, I feel like more PC players that already don't have a console are going to be in that camp. Like, the only reason that I I got a Switch again is because I wanted to play the Nintendo exclusive games I couldn't get anywhere else, and I didn't. Yeah, but they also the don't port. Yeah, no, that's true. But I and, I and I didn't want to go through the hassle of emulating them. That's another thing, and that also feels like a more sort of extreme end of PC gamer culture. But, like, we can just port, or not port, we can just uh, pirate and or emulate your games. So, well, up to an extent. Right now, the limit for PlayStation is about PlayStation 3. Yeah. But still, patient gamer thing. Like, I think PC players are way more patient <laughs> than they think. But 
who knows? Yeah, it looks like right now the only emulator for PlayStation 4 only has very limited uh, compatibility with some uh, 2D games. Uh huh. So, so PlayStation Four emulation is still looking at years away. All right. I don't know if I have other things to say. This is interesting. It's an interesting move that I don't. Bold move. Yeah, it's a it's a bold move. I don't fully agree with it, but we'll see how it pans out. So, okay. Moving on to our first topic from the community corner. Um. New World's Community Review Bombs the Game on Steam. So, I don't know a lot about New World's. I had never played it. Um, I've, you know, heard about it. I yeah, heard about it. Talking about it. And pretty much just, meh. Yeah. But, you know, aside from, like, some brief conversations that I barely remember from us talking about it on the show, like, I've got no context for, for New World's. But apparently, it has been chugging along with a pretty devoted community... Um, who wants their game to be better, which is fine. But it, the game currently is being review-bombed on Steam. Uh, it seems like there, there's a few different reasons, um, with the major ones being... Let's see, I'm pulling up the the Reddit link and or, and the link that we got to Forbes. But upon reading some of the reviews and then browsing the Reddit thread and then the article from Forbes, kind of the main reasons seem to be, number one, the community has been asking for um, changes to be made for a long time uh, to balance and things to make the game more fun and rewarding. And they seemed to, or, and they have gone the other way, making the game more difficult, less fun and less rewarding. Um, there have been multiple delays on promised content patches and the most recent thing that they announced that was the community seemed pretty convinced that it was going to be updates and uh, improvements and bug fixes to the game was actually about announcing a console port. Um, and the things that they did change were broken or caused more issues resulting in like lost character progression or flat out just lost characters with support staff that were unwilling or unable to help solve the issues so the game is being review bombed to oblivion right now it's it's recent reviews are mostly negative and its overall review is has gone from overwhelmingly positive to mixed um within you know the the course of the weekend i mean just damn right <laughs> yeah i mean i can't blame them and also uh, at the same time it's just you know, get out right yeah, uh, and it's it's not even saying t go touch grass. It's more find a game that uh, respects your time more. Yeah, but that's a big problem with just MMOs in general is that you know you develop friendships, you develop uh, you know a, a, an entire social network in this one game, and it traps you. It gets you there, you know. And it's not so much well just leave because you know you're ripping away you know an entire social structure, you know? Yeah. And that's a lot of time and effort that goes in. The The idea of the sunk cost fallacy can come into play for certain people. I mean, I mean, is it really a fallacy at this point whenever it's, you know, friendships that's been built over years and years and all around being, playing this game, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you make a point, but that's just, you know, the name of the... I, I know, I, I know, I know, I would... I was just, I'm trying to not sound like an asshole and saying, you know, uh, I don't want to sound like the person, go touch grass. You know? Yeah. Grass is outside, and outside is scary. Mm hmm But hey, with a Steam Deck, you can go touch grass and play your MMO. There you go. I mean, I do believe it's important to be well-rounded, generally speaking, or at least have different areas of interest so that if something happens to one of them... Mm -hmm. Or your ability to engage with it. It's not devastating. But, you know, people... Fan is short for fanatic, so... Fans of things can sometimes... Uh, let's say, be a little silly. But yeah. Sucks for the players. Like, there's no way around that. Like, it sucks. Um, losing progress or characters. Being told that things were going to get fixed and actually they got worse. Mm -hmm. That sucks. 
and seeing the big announcement be all just console stuff. Yep. So I will continue to not play this game. Uh, pretty much the same. I mean, I think I, I just don't have the time for MMOs in general these days. And they've all gone down the kind of World of Warcraft rabbit hole of being theme parks. Yeah. Where, you know, you miss out on one event and suddenly like you're way behind on everything, right? Yep. Yeah, I think I'll just stick with Stardew Valley. Get, get myself a nice cozy game. I mod the ever-loving shit out of it. Yeah. I'll uh, stick to playing weird games with the existential meaning and crisis, and then also my, my, big sh- my big stompy robot stuff. I mentioned this to you, and I'm not going to go off on it right now, but, mm-hmm. you know, MechWarrior 5 had some new DLC, and my kid wanted to start playing, so been uh, been engaging with some of that. That'll show up on a future show to talk about new things and changes well, and stuff. But well, While we were recording, I was resyncing uh, my Stardew Valley mod set uh, to the Steam Deck. Yeah. Yeah, it transferred 5,000 files. <laughs> Oops, right? <laughs> yeah. It's only 5,000. I've just found the easiest way to do it is just set up a, a file transfer server and just you know, do the entire thing uh, as a single block. Yeah. Uh, easy for me to say, right? Yeah. It's good, though. I mean, it's smart. All right. Well, Our until last... it breaks. Well, everything is smart and fine until it breaks. Uh, speaking of broken things. Yeah. Starfield's latest update draws player ire by sticking a bounty hunting quest behind the Creation Club paywall. Uh... Wow. Paywall. Had to, had to bring it back. <laughs> uh... Well, I guess uh, the idea that Starfield uh, was feeling a little lacking content makes a little bit more sense now, huh? Yeah. I I don't really recall a lot about the Bounty Hunter one. I I think that... Isn't that the one that only had a handful of quests in it to begin with? Yeah, and a lot of them were generic, too. Um, That was like, you know, use the bounty tracker board... Go to X location, kill Y guy, or kill Z spaceship. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of the bounty stuff. There were a couple of uh, sort of generic side quests that seemed to hint that there was more bounty hunter stuff going on in the the world, but they never materialized into anything. Yeah, occasionally uh, you'd have the, like, main storyline of the bounty hunters, but you had to do a bunch of the filler shit as well. Yeah. So it turns out the filler shit, uh, you know, has a little bit more uh, filler shit. And then if you really want to play the uh, actually interesting ones, uh, time to get out the credit card. Yep. So uh, I'm not. I'm not surprised. Neither am I. But to just like clearly explain what's going on, the the article in question and lays it out. Um. So to to summarize, uh, the the update adds new bounty hunting quest lines and the game mechanics to the game. The mechanics are just added as part of the update. And the first quest is available to you quote unquote for free as part of the update. But in order to get the second quest and continue the quest line, you have to pay uh, 700 credits in the, you know, creation club points or whatever. And, you have to, of course, you can't just buy 700 credits. You have to purchase 1,000, which costs $10. And it leaves you with those 300 leftover mm-hmm. hanging credits. And there's your sunk cost, right? Yep. So that's, that's the gist of what is happening. It looks like it's not just the quest. There's also other stuff on the Creation Club, too, like a ship module that is... Looks really powerful, and it's ten dollars all by itself. It has, I'm trying to remember it. I think that's four gun turrets on the, or gun weapon slots on the top. Could attach uh, two uh, modules on the front. It just yeah, you know, it ha- offers a lot of options, and it's ten dollars. Right? Yeah. I don't. You know, Starfield. Fucking Starfield. I wanted you to be good, but alas, at best, you were simply mediocre. And sinking fast. Yeah. 
mediocre and falling. Okay. I think that be- brings us neatly to the end of our our stuff for the day. Hey, Rage, how can people submit stuff to us and get in touch with us? Well, you can do so by sending us an email. You can do so at podcast at gmail.com. You can tweet us at podcast on the blue burb. Yes, it's still the blue burb. I ignore that letter. Or you can uh, send it to us on the Discord, which can find a link to that at beachhellpodcast.podbean.com. Yay. Woo. Um, do you do you want to give any any specific socials out for yourself? Uh, give me a CR if you need to contact me on uh, Twitter or Caffeine Rage on Steam. All right. And I've been at JMA4707 on Twitter and Blue Sky. And of course, you can reach out to me on Discord. Which, think... bring... yeah, which uh, brings us to closing. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's it, buddy. Why don't you take us home? Well, once again, you can ta- contact us, VGL Podcast at jbl.com. With your letters, voicemails, game related topics, tweet them to us, VGL Podcast. Or drop by the Discord. You can find a link to that at vglpodcast.podbean.com. And if you used to spread the love, you can find us on your podcatcher of choice. Our lovely, lovely patrons make this podcast possible. You can find out more about that over at patreon.com slash Podcast. Our intro and outro music is on the ground by Kevin, Mal- Kevin McLeod. You can find his work over at incomputech.com. And as always, as his lovely music starts to roll across my voice, bye bye now. See ya. Bye bye.